Okay. So let's start. Um, I really thank uh, Brendan to be to be here today. Uh, he's coming from Brussels. He we still have a problem with the projector, but it will switch on. So he, he comes from Brussels. Uh, uh, I mean, we we contacted him not so long ago. So thank you very much for for participating in, in this very important uh, seminar and on a very important topic: what is environmental justice about? So you have. 45 to minutes to one hour, and then we'll have discussion. Thanks. Okay. So you have your mic. You'll give me a sign after 45 minutes? Or... No okay, cool. All right. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the delay. I trained in from Brussels. It was surprisingly smooth, actually. But it's Friday afternoon, so... Yeah, um, I know I'm standing between you and the weekend, so I'm going to try and make this as nice as possible so you don't regret coming over for a Friday night talking about environmental justice. Um, you'll let me know later on if you regret it or not. A um, few words on where I speak from. Um, I'm, I'm an interdisciplinary trained scholar. So I was trained in uh, engineering science, uh, in environmental science, and then I did my PhD in social and political science. So I try and mingle that into something that resembles something vaguely scientific. Um, and my focus, my topic of expertise is environmental justice. Um, I'll tell you all about it in a minute, but I have tried and applied this mainly in rural areas, working on with farmers communities, working in rural areas on uh, territorial development projects, on economic development, on uh, land use management, and that kind of projects on what, what would a just outcome of these processes be. Um, and then recently I've been trying to sort of expand that a bit to other environmental problems. Um, just so you know a bit, and we can later on, we can discuss how that impacts the way I look at certain things, but just to give you an idea of where I uh, speak from. Environmental justice can be a lot of things and, 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 I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to give you the straightforward definition of, right, this is environmental justice. It's a lot of different things, uh, depending on the context in which we mention it. I guess the easiest, most straightforward way in which we can define or understand justice is by looking at what it's not, the injustice, right? And the injustice, the environmental injustice is a social ecological reality. And I'll, I'll give you plenty of examples later on about what that means, okay? That social ecological reality has triggered a political movement starting in the US in the 70s. I'll run you through the history of, of how that happened and what it has produced. One of the things it has produced is a set of policy principles. And some of that have been applied with some results. We'll look at what it triggered and how it worked. Um, and then in the end, it also triggered a school of thought, a discipline, a field of scientific inquiry work. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that, but not too much. It's, it's a bit theoretical. Um, so in a nutshell, environmental justice is all of this, right? Before I run you through these different elements, I'll just give you two definitions. One is a very policy focused one that was developed by the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. Environmental justice is a fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulation and policies. You can see how the definition is very tailored to policy making, right? It's fair treatment, meaningful involvement. It's almost a sort of checkbox approach, right? I have a fair treatment, I have involved everyone, I have justice. I have achieved justice in a way. 
um, obviously EPA policy frameworks that has to be workable in a way. It's not very useful to understand what environmental justice is in a political sense, right? This definition perhaps can help us make sense of that. And this definition is by uh, geographer David Harvey from this book, Justice, Nature and the Geography of Difference, which I think is, is one of the Bibles of the environmental justice, um, not the movement, but the, the school of thought. And Harvey defines it as having its, its origin in the inequalities of power and how these inequalities of power have uh, distinctive environmental consequences. Inequalities of power have distinctive environmental consequences. That's, that's the key in here. Um, it's about power. The way in which we face the consequences of the environmental crisis are about power, right? The more power you have, however defined, even if that's purely symbolic, the less you're likely to be impacted by environmental consequences, right? I'll give you some examples. And I'm deliberately simplifying the argument here. So the injustice is first a social ecological reality. One of the first reports that showed this was published in 87 by a religious group that was called the United Church of Christ. And I'm mentioning this because religious groups in the US have played a key role in making this visible in working with communities and making it visible. Um, in a report that was called Toxic Waste and Race in the United States, what it showed in a nutshell is this. The distribution in Memphis, Tennessee of waste sites, toxic waste sites that are represented here in the small circles. You can't see in the back, but these circles have numbers. The higher the number, the higher the waste, the number of waste sites. And they combine this information with the amount of black population in certain areas. So the more densely populated the areas are by black population, the more dots you have. What it shows is that these toxic waste sites are mainly found in places where black population live, right? It's, it doesn't confirm everywhere. It's a trend, obviously. But that's what the first report on this showed. So you, there was an acknowledgement of, wait a minute, we have all these toxic waste sites and we had a feeling that hmm, uh, we had more than other people, but we didn't know really that, you know, how bad it was. And that's when it starts to become visible. That's when the communities, African-American communities and environmental justice scholars start teaming up in making this visible. But it's not just, I'm going to talk a lot about the US because it's, they have a lot of empirical data that we don't have in Europe, but it's not just in the US. This is from my town and from my city, Brussels. This map shows the distribution of income in the city. The darker the color, the poorer the neighborhoods. So you have this poor, um, in French, they call it the croissant pauvre, the poor crescent that is around the city center here. If you combine that information with the distribution of green areas in the city, the distribution of heat islands in the city, the distribution of diabetes in the city and the distribution of, um, what is it? Um, work, work related uh, uh, accidents, all of them show the same pattern that it is in that poor percent that you have the highest forms of the highest expression of environmental impacts, right? Broadly defined, including work and diabetes and health, um, broadly defined. This is another map also from Brussels that shows air pollution was published last year, a very broad uh, citizen science project, very impressive, um, same pattern, right? Air pollution, the warmer the color, the less, uh, uh, the, 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 the worse the air quality is. So you could say, okay, that's just, you know, a distribution, that's just an inequality, sort of neutral inequality, right? If you combine that with the information about car ownership, what it shows is that those neighborhoods that have 
um, the least lower level of ownership of cars are also those with the highest level of air pollution. So basically, in a very simple way, those that have cars pollute neighborhoods where people don't have cars. So there's a form of injustice that is created. It's not just a form of a neutral sort of inequality. There is a combination between the source of the pollution and, and those who are impacted by it. Another example, Paris was published a few weeks ago. Um, this map shows consumption of, uh, for uh, related to heating the homes. And this map shows uh, income distribution in Paris. Well, obviously this comes from the fact that some people have bigger homes than other people, um, but it shows that income is going to be a key indicator if we want to target lower consumption related to heating our homes, we have to target these people, right? Not these people. Um, again, simplifying the argument, just to show you that um, the environment is not, the distribution of the environment, as we understand it, is not neutral. The, the distribution of the environmental impact. Locally, but also globally. You know this graph, very famous by now, right? Um, and this is the same kind of information. It's just expressed differently. Um, the richest 1%, the, the, the richest 10% of the planet consume about or emit about 50% of greenhouse gases. So that's important in itself, but the combination between the local and the global is also important. Why? because most people in this room will be here, right? But may not be here. So the way in which you're going to address environmental injustices locally is not the same way you're going to address it globally, right? There's going to be a trade-off potentially between the people you're going to, willing to do, be willing to target depending on the scale at which you address the issue. This is also something you know, emission distribution on the global scale. Basically the global north is much more responsible for the emission of greenhouse gases. And this is to be put in contrast with the impacts, whether it is about climate change vulnerability, whether it is about water stress around the world, whether it is about the projected impact on agricultural yields, or whether it is on the projected average rise of temperature, all of these are going to be expressed mainly in the global south or at a higher rate in the global south. So you have a mismatch between where it is emitted and where uh, people are impacted by it. So I kind of already gave it away, but um, one argument is to say, well, this is, you know, biogeographical distribution. It just happens, you know, uh, emission just happens to travel around the world and, uh, and it's impacted in certain places. Well, luckily we have a lot of empirical evidence that sort of debunks that completely. Um, these three maps are not about the environment. They're about the distribution, um, the territorial segregation in the US that goes back all the way to the 19th century. And probably before that, um, this is the distribution between free states, slave states, and territories in the US and how it has translated over time to get to a situation where, that you probably know of, where African-American population are located in what is now called the Black Belt, right? This Southeast, um, part of the US. So if the environmental impacts are neutrally distributed across the country, then we should, you know, see this happening everywhere. And yet, if we look at life expectancy by districts here, the lighter the color, the less you're going to live, basically. Um, or whether we look at a health index, the darker the color, the worse your health is going to be. Whether we look at stroke death rates, again, the darker the color, 
the, the, the higher li your likelihood of dying of a, of a stroke, or whether, whether we look at long cancer distribution, the warmer the color, um, the higher your likelihood of long cancer, or whether we look at other indicators like food hardship, or what we call food desert. Food desert is a situation in which you don't have access to food, you don't have access to supermarkets, you don't have access to a car, so you live in places that are technically food deserts. You don't have easy access to something that feeds you, right? Where are these food deserts located? Southeast. And if we look at more traditional indicators of the environmental justice struggle, whether it's um, landfills, industrial, municipal, hazardous landfills, or oil refineries with a very strong concentration here around the Gulf of Mexico, um, Louisiana, uh, New Orleans, very known uh, place, well-known place for uh, oil refinery. Same pattern, the Southeast is more exposed than the rest of the countries to largely any environmental indicator you can come up with, okay? And these leads to some people saying like Robert Bullard, who's one of the, he calls himself the father of environmental justice because he was one of these people that was very influential in, uh, or instrumental in, in, in making all of this visible. Zip code is still the most potent predictor of an individual health and well-being. Basically, if you live in the US, um, you can take your zip code and that is going to be a very good indicator of the kind of environmental impact you're going to face. Just by the place, your location, by where you live. And as it happens, it is targeting it is closely related to um, racial distribution, racial uh, um, segregation on uh, the American uh, territory. And so um, we can't just say that it's a, a simple biogeographical distribution. And if you want to address some of these problems, um, that's where we'll have to start, right? You can't have, um, in a sense, you can't have a neutral, an apolitical um, environmental policy that wouldn't take these things into account because you would still have this, that imbalance and, and, and uh, not only would it be unjust, but it would probably be also um, ineffective. This reality, the social ecological reality has triggered a movement or several movements. There's actually two different approaches. The first approach is um, it was a US thing. It was only a U.S. thing. It was a local movement, game national, led by um, racial minorities in the U.S. But then later work, especially in the political ecology literature, has sort of questioned that and said, well, actually, there was a bunch of movements before that, and they didn't call themselves environmental justice, but they were looking at this intersection between a whole bunch of social divides whether it's race or income or gender or anything you like. And they've appeared in hundreds of different places um, and their story has never been told. I'll give you some examples. First, in the US. Most people would start probably in the 80s when they talk about environmental justice. I like to talk a bit, I like to start a bit earlier with this photo that you probably all know of. Right? This is Martin Luther King, you know, he was assassinated in that place. What you probably don't know is why he was in Memphis in 1968. He was in Memphis because of this, because of a sanitation strike. All these people here are sanitation workers, they collect your trash. Right? In Memphis in the 60s, all the people that collected trash were African American people. There was an accident, two people died, and all of a sudden it became very clear that working conditions, especially with sanitation workers, became a key element of um, the, civic right, the civil rights movement. And so that's why Luther King was in Memphis, where he got shot, to support that sanitation strike. 
So some people say that actually the civil rights movement from the 60s onwards had integrated an environmental dimension through, of course, through the specific issue of sanitation and waste management and whatnot, not environment as a whole, not nature, not wilderness, but waste management in urban areas. This image is also so telling about some of the justice dimension behind that. What it says, I'm a man, is people claiming to, you know, asking to be recognized simply as human beings, right? And so one of these dimensions of environmental justice is going to be that recognition that some people are treated differently when we're talking about the environment just of who they, because of who they are, right? In this case, if it were white sanitation workers, probably the working conditions would have been different. The real sort of highlight of the environmental justice movement is this Warren County in, in 82, North Carolina, um, a waste dump was to be created for uh, dumping PCB. PCB is one of these gases that was used in, uh, in, your, in, in the fridges in the 80s to keep uh, your food cool. Um, and there was no way of destroying that or dealing with that. So it was put in landfills. A landfill was to be created, uh, surprise, in an African-American community. And so it triggered the whole movement that was starting to, you know, uh, know about how the distribution of these things uh, uh, was playing out and that they were targeted, in a sense, uh, with these landfills. And so they set up this whole new uh, movement that didn't exist, initially called it environmental racism, because you know the African American uh, community in there was 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 very dominant in defining the issue, um, and they set up a whole bunch of activities and and protests and marches and and civil disobedience around these landfills. I use this picture not not for you know not just by accident. If you look at what is happening in the recent years on civil disobedience movement, this, this, this should be very familiar, right? This is strategies that have been used recently by, you know, Extinction Rebellion and other movements. Um, things that were introduced, in a sense, in the 70s and 80s by African-American communities in the U.S. Imagine a bit the political context in which this happened. This is North Carolina. This is a former slave state. We're in the 80s, right? The, the racial issue in the US is not solved. It's still not solved. So imagine in the 80s, what kind of danger you put yourself in by lying, by putting yourself on the road like this to block something related to a waste site that wasn't you know, on the high political agenda or anything. There were other cases. This is again in New Orleans. It was an area that was called Cancer Alley because the rate of cancer was so high um, that it was, it was renamed like that. And just basically the waste dumps were open in the air around the communities. They were just there. And of course, all that waste was, uh, um, uh, was getting into uh, the water, the drinking water, um, and was impacting the communities very directly through uh, cancer rates. Um, then later on, um, other racial minorities, ethnic and racial minorities, starting to notice that actually um, maybe we're also impacted by this. It's not just the African American community. And so in the 90s, um, the uh, Indigenous Environmental Network was created um, by uh, First Nation Indigenous people that. Uh, noticed that in, in the reserves that they had been assigned to, um, there were the same kind of issues, the same forms of unequal distribution were found uh, around their um, areas. So that's, in a nutshell, the, the local movement. The global movement tells a bit of a different story. It starts earlier. This is in the 70s, a movement called the Chipko movement. Chipko means to hug. Uh, basically, it's a women's movement of tree, hug tree huggers, um, and they were protecting trees um, that were to be cut for um, eucalyptus plantations, eucalyptus that were brought in by the British, 
um, because they were more profitable, they were export products, they would create local economies, blah, 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 whatnot. Um, and, it, and it triggers this um, impressive movement, women-led in India. Second example is in Kenya, the Green Belt Movement, uh, Wangara Matai, um, Nobel Prize in 90 something, sorry, I forgot, um, around desertification. Again, women led, um, willing to stop the uh, soil from degrading and from transforming into basically a desert by planting certain species in certain areas. What these two movements show us is that there is a gender dimension to it as well, which was fairly invisible in the African-American movement in the US. Um, specifically in this case, if you take away the, uh, the original forest, the native forest in these areas, and you replace them by plantations, um, what happens is the plantations are going to hire men, not women, to work on these plantations, whereas it was women that were used to manage the forest. It was women that held all the knowledge around the forest. It was women that were the sort of intermediary between the forest and the human community. And so by transforming that into a plantation that supposedly was more economically interesting, you were putting the women aside in that community. And so it wasn't just about the trees, obviously, it was about the position of women within these societies. Then closer to home and much more recently, different movements emerged and the Galanda in, in Germany around uh, coal extraction. Um, in France, Notre Dame des Landes, construction, project of construction of an airport. And most famously, of course, the climate justice movement that had, has really become since the Paris Agreement. I think it was Francois Hollande who said something like, I speak in the name of climate justice or something like that. And this really has triggered, uh, funnily enough, has triggered the movement that has reused the term that already existed for a few decades in the US and elsewhere, has really triggered the movement um, around uh, this combination of social justice and climate change, right? Made visible in France a few years ago with the Yellow Vest Movement. Some people say the Yellow Vest Movement may have been the first environmental just movement in, in France. I don't know if I would agree, but there is something to it, right? There, there, is, there is at least a question of end of the month, end of the world sort of the same struggle, that we have the same objective. Uh, we're looking at the same root system that is causing both these problems. What has this triggered? One thing is potentially a new paradigm around what the environment means. So one of the things that the, the US movement says a lot is that the environment is where we live, work, and play. The environment is not the big green areas, the national parks, you know, the, the wilderness. It's what is around you, is your community, is where your kids play, it's where you go to work, it's the sanitation workers. So what we understand as the environment is not nature with a big N, what, we understand, what the movement understands as the environment is the immediate environment. And so that divide between nature on one end and culture on the other doesn't really make sense in that context, okay? So they question very openly this separation between social issues and environmental issues, what um, a French philosopher recently called the double fracture of modernity, Malcolm Ferdinand. Um, and the movement also redefined what inequality and injustice meant from the ground up. From the ground up is the title of a book by uh, these authors. I can give you all the references later of how the movement wasn't triggered by philosophical discussion on what just what a just world should be, but was just redefining across 
the sort of academic hair splitting around what justice should be or should not be around the very normative idea of justice. These movements are just saying, you know, we're faced with this forms of inequality. This is unjust, and this is how we perceive environmental justice, right? They're plural, they're intersecting, they're acting at the same time. We're faced by all of these things together. It's not just one thing. It's not just distribution. It's not just participation. It's all of these things together. I'll come back to these dimensions uh, in a minute. But most of all, what these movements manage to do is put environmental justice on the political and the economic agenda. What they did is in the 90s, they created the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. And that was a, a massive success. It was over 600 grassroots uh, organizations in the US with environmental NGOs. So in the 90s, the environmental NGOs started understanding basically that they have a race issue, that it's too wide, it's too middle class, it's too high income, and that they're missing out on part of the picture. And so this is the first time that the environmental movement and the civil rights movement are sort of joining hands in creating this. Sorry about this slide. Um, it's just to show you uh, some of the things that the movement comes up with uh, in terms of principles of environmental justice. And it goes all the way from the sacredness of Mother Earth, so a very sort of relational um, clearly influenced by indigenous people, First Nation, attachment to the land, relationship with the land, kinship ethics kind of thing, to very straightforward things like the right of workers to a safe environment, right? All of that exists within the same political space, which is, if you ask me, it's pretty impressive uh, if, if you look at some of the discussion uh, within the environmental movement uh, today. I'll, I can come back to this later on if, if you want to discuss this. One of the highlights of this mobilization is 1994, Bill Clinton here in the middle. You see young Al Gore here uh, behind. This is Robert Bullard, by the way, that I mentioned earlier, the father of environmental justice. And they create the Executive Order on Environmental Justice. What does this Executive Order say? It says that the EPA, that I mentioned earlier on with the definition, the EPA has to develop a tool, an environmental justice tool that is going to check any new federal environmental law against environmental justice issues. We're deciding about a new law. Is that going, how is that going to impact? What's the differentiated impact of this policy? And if obviously it, it, it has a differentiated impact, then it should be remedied. There's a lot of discussion in the literature on whether actually that triggered the change that people expected of it. Probably not. But it's still this watershed moment of the environmental justice movement. It's not just in the US. It's not just locally or federally. Um, it also influenced this. Our common future was the base report of the sustainable development discourse. You probably know this from this masterclass, probably other people have talked about this, you know this definition. What I want to attract your attention to is the justice dimensions to it. A world in which poverty and inequity are endemic will always be prone to ecological and other crises. It's there. You, you can't solve the environmental problem if you have poverty and inequity. It's there in the 80s in the driving document of the last 30 years of environmental policymaking. Same with the big definition of sustainable development. You know this definition. The ability of future generation to meet their own needs. What does that say? That's justice to future generation. That is a justice dimension right there in the definition. This was done, adopted at the Earth Summit, transformed into sustainable development. Sustainable development itself, the words, is the expression is very interesting, right? Environment, conference on environment and development. It's not just the environment itself anymore. It's development issues pushed in large part by the global south, obviously. Um, but it says a lot about how the conception of the environment sort of evolved from the sort of ecocentric tendencies of the 60s and 80s into the 90s where it became an issue of development. For better or for worse, huh? 
sometimes this is, you know, development was a way to avoid having to take any environmental policy at all. But it just tells you a bit how the conception of the environment sort of emerged. And then this triggered two very important documents that you know of, the UNFCCC, UNF, uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, in its Article 3 says that the, particle, the party should protect the climate system for the benefit of present and future generation on the basis of equity and in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities. Future generations, equity, common but differentiated responsibilities, capabilities, all justice principles, all of them. So climate change, according to UNFCCC, is a justice issue. The CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, in its first article, one of its objectives is the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of utilization of genetic resources. One of its objectives of the main instrument for biodiversity conservation, of which the COP is happening right now in Montreal, by the way, um, is about fair and equitable sharing of benefits, right? It's not about the conservation of these genetic resources or not only, obviously it's also that, but it's about the fair and equitable sharing of things that flow from them. You can't solve one without the other. How are we doing with time? Uh, I did 40 minutes, okay, great. And this leads us to the last element that is a school of thought. That's where I am. That's where I work. That's what I do, right? It triggered a massive amount of literature, right? Lots of books, you know, go to Amazon and type environmental justice. You have shitloads of books on environmental justice. This whole first line here is about US, um, the, the issue in the US, different communities, Hispanic communities, African-American communities on different topics, garbage on, uh, that's, that's the other book that I mentioned from the ground up. Um, and the lower line is how um, the school of thought just exploded geographically, right? Expanded on different things, on different subjects, um, all the way to, of course, today, climate justice that um, written by Mary Robinson, bestseller, uh, Mary Robinson, former U.S. representative, uh, former Irish prime minister, I think, um, is not, you know, it's not sort of uh, dry academic literature. It, it has become bestsellers uh, in, uh, um, in, in, in the literature. The the scholarship kind of evolved over time. It, it started with, you know, these 80s reports on um, documenting environmental inequalities in African-American communities, purely empirical documentation. We didn't have that. We didn't know. We had a feeling that this was happening, but we didn't have it. So we had to map it. Uh, so one of the early things was, was using geography, um, which is funny because it was initially sociologists that started using geography tools to, to map that um, and to, to make it visible for policymakers. Look, this is happening. This is, there's an overlap there. You can't, you, know, you can't ignore this. That was the first generation. The second generation was really about pluralizing that, expanding the concept. Um, some people talked about the multivalence of um, environmental justice. It was applied to a whole set of new, uh, new problems, energy justice, food justice, climate justice, just conservation, you name it. Um, and of course, a, a very strong geographical expansion to other parts of the world. Um, some people talked about a conceptual transfer from the US into different parts of the world. And then we're now probably in what can be called the third generation of environmental justice called a, a more critical form of environmental justice studies that uh, according to someone like David Pello, um, sociologist in uh, the US, pushes our analysis and action beyond the human, the state and capital. So a more critical form um, of environmental justice. One of the points that it makes is that the environmental justice community in the US was very focused on um, targeting the state which is funny in a country like the US, uh, 
uh, you would think that you know movement would rely on other other ways of making change happen than than the state, right? And yet the environmental justice community chose to focus specifically on state action with some of the things that I told you, with the, some of the effects that I, that I explained. David Palo says, maybe that was a mistake. Maybe that was a mistake because of the structural problems of state action in a country like the US, but, but also in a country, in other countries. Um, and, you know, the issue of uh, uh, um, state-driven policy making in France is 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 a, is a whole different world, but this is something that if you want to discuss these issues in a country like France, this is probably something you should address as well. Um, triggered the whole bunch of other things: intersectional environmental justice, decolonial theory, and environmental justice, and and uh, multi-species justice, like not only looking at humans uh, that you can read up on if you're um, if you're interested. One of the things, of course, that the environmental justice scholarship is interested in is what is that justice, right? So you can rely on the justice literature. Um, John Rawls makes a very interesting definition about justice being the, the first virtue of social institution, right? Other people like Michael Sandel, philosophy professor at Harvard says, um, justice is more like the right thing to do. It's more like an individual thing where your decision that drives your decision, right? The principles you use in justifying your decision, the right thing to do, that's that's what justice is. So it's a bit of a difference, right? A more individual take versus a more sort of collective take. I myself would be more in that third um, influence which is the, the Nancy Fraser group. Nancy Fraser is a, a feminist scholar at a new school in New York. And she says that, well, if Rawls is right, then what we should be doing as scholars is exactly this, evaluating whether social arrangements, social institutions, understood in a large sense of the word, are just. We come up with an environmental policy, is that just? So how do we define whether that is just? Perhaps you, some of you know this <coughs> riddle or this um, game. Imagine you have a wooden flute that was found in a village, okay? You have to give it to someone, just one person. You have one flute, okay? You can give it to Anne, who's the best flute player, okay? Or you can give it to Bob, who's the poorest of the three kids. Or you can give it to Carla, who's made the flute. Okay? Who gives it to Anne? Don't be shy. No one gives it to Anne. Interesting. Who gives it to Bob? Why do you give it to Bob? Okay, fair enough. Who else gives it to Bob in the back? You read? Yeah. They can't share the flute. It's just one flute, one person. <laughs> yeah. Right. Very good point. Who gives it to Carla? Carla is the one who made the flute. Oh, you can make another one. <laughs> she can decide because she made it, right? All of these arguments, they're all justice principles. Ownership is one of the key theories of justice. All of these arguments are justifications of how we behave, how we decide about social institutions. How do we decide about distribution? This is an issue of distribution. The elements, the principles on which we decide together on who's going to get this flute is a justice discussion. Now imagine it's not a flute, but the benefits that arise from mining extraction. 
which we know has a massive environmental impact, we have to distribute this principle, how, uh, this, these benefits. How do we do that? It's the same kind of question. Obviously not that simple and not as funny, but it's something like that. Yes. No. Yeah, there was like a sort of a floor and then you go up. Absolutely. So maybe, okay, it's nice that the, the one that could do it had the, to say, probably, I don't know, everyone should be able to do a flute. And then if she does the flute, she can have it. Uh, but, but I don't know what to think about it. I think Rawls made an exception for um, uh, in, an income based exception. Is that social? just under the condition that they would help the least well off in society and so i would think he would give it to what was his name bob yeah i i think rawls would have given it to bob but you would have to ask him <laughs> um apart from that there's a big discussion in the scholarship on whether we should theorize at all some people like david harvey that i talked about him earlier says well if we don't then we're just going to have a sort of assemblage of um, particular risk postures that don't lead us anywhere. It's a trap, it's a dead end, right? So we have to come up with a theory. Well, David Harvey is a Marxist uh, uh, geographer, so you know where this comes from, right? You have a question? Maybe wait, maybe we'll yeah, we'll, we'll do that later. <laughs> the, the second approach is, why do we need to theorize? The movement gives us that, that, and this is Emily Ash, a, a French philosopher, and she says, well, actually, you know, people have this tendency of wanting to theorize something as if it was lacking a theory. Whereas what the movement shows us is that it redefines inequality and injustice by its very actions. And that is the theory. That is a form of grounded theory in a sense, right? One person that tried to merge both worlds is David Schlossberg. David Schlossberg is an American uh, philosopher who's based in, in Australia. And he comes up with this um, three dimensions of environmental justice, which have become very influenced. One is the issue of distribution. How do we distribute the impact, environmental impacts, for example, across the territory? That's the whole initial idea of who is impacted, how do we distribute all of that, right? Very straightforward um, allocation of benefits, allocation of harms, distribution on territory. Procedure is one of these other big dimensions. Remember the definition of the EPA? Fair treatment, that's distribution. Meaningful involvement, that's procedure. Who sets at the table when we decide about environmental policy making, right? Recognition is that third element that I mentioned with the I am a man march, right? Respect for cultural difference, because the way in which we define the environment, the way we define what should be protected in the first place is always going to be culturally defined. So if you don't understand that cultural difference in the way we do environmental policy making, you're not going to understand that it has differentiated impacts and that it may not be effective in certain areas. And then there's another strand of the literature which I've contributed to in part, which you know, calls itself a more sort of empirical form of environmental justice, uses environmental justice more as an analytical framework. But it's not saying necessarily what is just. It's more like setting up a framework, trying to understand what's the community here, what kind of dimensions come up, uh, what kind of principles are being used to justify certain actions or not, how are the injustices produced and how do we respond to it? It's a more sort of um, a lens, if you will, an analytical lens that can be applied irrespectively of the environmental problem we're looking at by trying to understand the diversity of dimensions of justice that may be present in um, a struggle. I'll leave it here because I think I'm out of time. Um, there's a lot more resources and obviously this was you know, a very short crash course on environmental justice. There is some resources out there that I've set up for you to
uh, enjoy. One is the environmental justice email list. That's basically the scholarships community uh, on environmental justice. It was it's fairly recent. Um, it has about 500 members. If you want to keep track of the literature on environmental justice, that's where you should be. I published this book a few years ago. It's organized as a handbook. Um, simple language, example cases, uh, key messages, key literature, it's all in there. And I fought hard with Rotledge to keep it at a very low price. So, you know, the, these academic books sometimes can be um, crazy expensive. And then finally, um, an environmental justice MOOC that we worked on with colleagues at the University of East Anglia in the UK. That's a free online course. It's five week long. It's uh, aired two times a year and you can sign up um, on this link if you are interested in knowing more. Thank you very much. Should I take a pen? Shoot, I'm listening. Oh, okay. I, um, I, I really like the presentation. Thank you so much. There's so much the more, of course, that we will probably all want to learn about. Um, I think the, the one of the things that I, I wanted to learn more about um, is uh, you talked about how uh, there's like a third generation of environmental justice. So it seems that this um, this co concept of environmental justice, it kind of evolves with every generation. And um, given that we're getting more and more globalized and we've got all this technology to connect us, I mean, uh, do you feel that this drives this this consciousness is is that's one part. And the the second part is how then can we keep up with this um, this evolution? And it seems to be speeding up with the more we're connected. And so the last part of the question is, is there like a live assessment tool? I mean, we've got books, but by the time the books come out, it's evolved again. So that's kind of my question. <laughs> so I'll start by the end. There is a live assessment tool that was developed by the EPA. Um, it, well, live, I mean, Obviously, you have to input the data, and there's a lag between inputting the data and what is actually happening on the ground. It's never going to be live, live, but the EPA has developed, I think it's called the Environmental Justice Tool. Uh, you can Google it, and it has a platform in which you can basically tick boxes on, okay, I want to see the intersection between income and this type of environmental problem in this area, for example. Obviously, only in the US, but um, that's the closest we get to this sort of live uh, monitoring in a way of environmental justice. And that's probably one of these areas in which, especially in Europe, we could invest a lot because a lot of data is out there is available. Um, it's just not visible. It's, you know, in databases. Uh, yeah. This is one of the things we're working on with, with different colleagues. Um, how the field evolves, um, I think it complexifies and that's, and I mean that in a good way, right? It was initially, very about distribution because that was the obvious starting point. Um, and then people starting to notice that actually, it's not just about distribution, obviously, it's about what triggers unfair distribution, right? In the US, racism was one of these things, right? The distribution is not just happening by accident, it's happening because race. Um, but race was just one of these indicators. Then people started working on income and poor people are also more affected by uh, climate change, for example, just in this, you know, most straightforward way because they have less means of adapting to, you know, heat or, uh, uh, or cold or whatever. Um, and so people started complexifying that, saying, well, it's not just about rates, it's about all of these other dimensions, it's about gender as well, it's about income, it's about all of these things. So it complexifies, and that's a good thing, because it helps us better understand how the injustices are produced. And, and, and potentially how to, to fight them in a way. Um, what was the second element of that question? Um, I think it was more about the, um, the evolving consciousness. I think you answered that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think.
Pareto. I, I don't know how to answer that. Yeah, you, can you read your question? On yeah, yes, I wanted to know your, your opinion about the uh, Pareto optimality and also the conclusion that when you have externalities, you have to internalize them in the system. Does it have like really implications or is it just like an economist fantasy? And uh... <laughs> um, I, I think initially in the, in, and I'm going to speak from the environmental justice perspective, of course, right? I'm not an economist. Um, I think initially there was a, a very strong drive in that internalization of um, inefficiencies of outputs or whatever it was, whatever you want to call it. Um, in part because um, I think there was a bit of a naive idea of responsibility within the movement, but also within the scholarship. Um, and this is one of the weaknesses, I'd say, of both the movement and the scholarship is that the thinking on responsibility has never, um, was only starting recently. Um, and so there was this naive idea that if we managed to either get the state to regulate or we get businesses to internalize certain costs and therefore reduce the impact, or that we're going to sort of reach, achieve justice in a way, we'll reach a stage in which that is um, the right stage. And I think the newer forms of the more critical forms think of justice more as a, a process-based approach in which it's about the evolution, it's about the process in which you achieve justice. Justice is an horizon that you're never going to achieve. So it's never going to be as simple as just internalizing something that wasn't accounted for. It's not just a matter of distributing the right thing. You're never going to achieve justice in a way. And that can be sad, and it can be disappointing, but it can also be a way of looking at it's an ongoing struggle and it's never going to be finished, right? Um, so I think the more critical recent literature is questioning the sort of um, reductionist thinking that certain economists tend to uphold on um, how certain injustices uh, should be uh, should be achieved. One of the most visible uh, works in France on environmental justice is, is led by economists, but it's a very sort of distributive, uh, uh, quantitative approach on how things, how the impacts are being distributed. That doesn't say anything about all these sort of second and third generation. So that's an incomplete answer to your question, but yeah, I think that would, that's what the, the environmental justice scholarship would answer to that. Uh, professor, we've been taking a lot of environmental um, economics classes, and uh, there's a question in my mind, which is, um, what do you think is the ecological function of humans? And I just want to know your opinion. Wow. <laughs> um, okay, so again, coming from the environmental justice environment, right? Um, for a long time, it was purely anthropocentric, right? The literature, the movement, it was about where we live, work and play. We humans, all right? Um, the environment was, the, nature was just the environment. Nature was just what surrounds us in a way. But increasingly here, and that's what I, I mentioned earlier on, you have this ideas of multi-species justice, which has also triggered a thinking around Okay, perhaps um, the way in which the early environmental justice movement thought about humans and nature was problematic in that, well, in one sense it was good because it started breaking down the barriers between nature and culture, as I said. But on the other hand, it was completely invisibilizing the sort of uh, non-human community um, of justice in a sense. And so that new strand of the literature is trying to identify non-human species as communities of justice in the same sense as humans. That means that we owe them a sort of moral uh, behavior, right? That they're part of the moral community and that we should act upon that, okay? Um, so I don't know if that answers your questions about um, what the human 
can you say that again? The ecological function of humans. Um, but if 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 um, if your question is about the if your ecological function is about environmental justice, then I think that function is there. It's about making certain things visible that weren't visible, that the environment was excluding humans initially. And this was one of the points that the environmental justice movement made that were made invisible. You know, black people are not part of nature in the US, simplified. But then push this argument so far that it became the opposite problem is that all of these uh, non-human elements within the environment were pushed aside in a way. Um, so is that an ecological function? I don't know, but perhaps that's part of your, that's part of uh, my answer to your question. Okay, so th thank you, Professor. My question does not uh, mean to discount the role of this discussion, but given our current circumstances, we see that um, there is a long road to solve the climate crisis. And so I'm just wondering if discussions surrounding the environmental justice debate could distract us from focusing on the technical aspect of reducing emission and tackling the climate emergency. That's, that's my question. Well, it's exactly because we thought it was purely a technical discussion that we had this. It's exactly because we thought the environment was only about the environment that we forgot that it was about people and that it was impacting people differently. So it's not just a moral issue. I'm not making a normative point here or not only a normative point. I'm also making a very instrumental one is that if you don't solve that inequality issue, you're not going to solve the environmental crisis. You can't take your way out of this. Right? You can't just throw to take a recent discussion in the in the press nuclear fusion to this, because you're not you're only going to solve one piece of the puzzle, and all of this is not going to be solved. So this is not, I think the message here is not just that people are impacted, different people are impacted differently uh, by the environment. It's also to say that the environmental problem is a political issue at its very core. And this was very well understood in, 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 in the United Nations framework that had all these justice dimensions, because if you don't solve all these justice dimensions, you're not going to solve the, the climate problem. Um, I would love to have a simple technological fix to something that is purely technical but this, this is just not how it works, right? This, the, 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 we need more complexity to this, not less. And that makes it more difficult for policymakers. Policymakers love to have a simple story that they can throw some easy fix to, but I'm sorry, but this just doesn't work. That's not how the environmental problem unfolds in the last 50 years. Yes. Thank you for the great response, thank you. Relative spatial degradation um, that uh, at one point you don't have to think about environmental justice because if, if you manage at one point the transition, it, it, it will be just in a way. And another presenter told the um, situation is so uh, dramatic that it's not any more time, unfortunately, which are two very different considering. Yeah. yeah. Which is, in a way, the question could raised in another way. I, I don't think so. I, I, yeah, I would disagree. Um, yeah, I think it stands in the way of, of and not to say that we can't solve certain aspects of the problem, um, but I, I, I wouldn't agree with, with, with that argument. And I think all of that literature on environmental justice just points the way to how we've tried to serve, solve certain things or pretend we solve certain things by, um, by half-baked solutions. I mean, take the example of the yellow vest, right? We decide about raising taxes on fuel because, hey, it's a good thing, right? You wanna make oil and gas more expensive so people consume less. 
right? You want to internalize those costs, right? Everyone agrees with that, except some people that create the biggest social movement in the last uh, 30 years in France, right? Because, exactly because you didn't think of the social aspects of your policy. So you're going to create what the literature called justice barriers to, to a transition. You're going to trigger a barrier to any change because you didn't think of the social, the economic, the racial, the gender dimension of your policymaking. So perhaps you're going to solve certain issues, but if you're blocking the whole country because of something you missed in your analysis, like the yellow vest is a perfect illustration of this, you're, you're not going to have a transition at all. So it's, a, it's by, in its very nature, it's an intersectional problem. You have, it's intersecting at different social divides at the same time. Some people in the literature say that the environmental justice movement was an intersectional movement before it was called that. I don't know if that's true, but there's something to it. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, two questions. First one, um, I see by what you presented, you, you like Nancy Fraser, I, I hope. Um, and she, um, lay, uh, using the Polonian framework, she has this new idea of three triple movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, you are aware. So the question about I, this, I like... I my PhD. <laughs> oh, thank you. So my <laughs> question is, I'm going to be very direct. So how you think this environmental justice movement, which would be the third kind of wave movement, is uh, captured by market and by commodification? And the second question, which is a bit different, has to do with my uh, thesis, my uh, master thesis. Um, I, I'm going to work with biodiversity. And how do you see the place of animals in environmental justice? Because we know that in justice and ethical literature, um, there is a very hard tension, yes, whether animals have rights or not. Mm -hmm. And how do you think uh, the environmental justice um, framework may help us to think about biodiversity and include this in the discussion yeah. or in a more broad um, climate change yeah, transformations of the earth? Thank you. Okay. So can environmental justice be co-opted by, by commodification, by the ruling class, by capitalism, by, um, I, I mean, we would be naive to think it wouldn't. Everything before that, I mean, take the issue of sustainable development, perfect example of how um, it was completely co-opted by a form of commodification, um, organic agriculture. I mean, there's, there's plenty of examples. Um, and I think we already see some things happening. So one of my colleagues works, for example, with coal industries in India that are using the climate justice argument to argue in favor of coal because they create jobs, right? Economic development, that's justice, right? That's helping the poor, so it must be just, right? So it's a climate just approach. So we already see that certain forms, certain transformation of the climate justice discourse are being co-opted by certain actors. Whether it's going to go as far as you know, sustainable development, I don't know, because you still have that justice dimension to it, which is historically attached to social justice, to movement, to a very sort of political stance. Um, so I don't know if will manage to do that. One of the things we saw in recent years was the issue of just transition come up, which was initially pushed by the trade unions, um, but is now increasingly being used by, by uh, state-led policymaking, by uh, companies um, with you know, saying that, okay, we have to transition, but has to be just. And in a way, certain actors use that to sort of delay doing anything, basically. Because we're not agreeing on what is just exactly, so let's not transition just now. You know, let's wait for it. So there's there's an there's an instrumentalization of that discourse. Clearly, whether it's going to be fully co-opted, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, obviously. So I don't. I hope not. Um, and if it does, then it will be the task of the environmental justice movement to put that more radical edge into into the spotlight, in a sense, right? Um, so that's one, biodiversity. Um, I happen to also have written my PhD on biodiversity conservation. So Fraser and biodiversity, well done. <laughs> um, so 
<laughs> my so my i don't know what i it's uh, i have so many things in my head that i have to uh, select certain things to uh, tell you um what is interesting about biodiversity is that unlike for climate change and this may sound a bit weird but climate change in a sense has a fairly simple solution to it right if you stop emitting greenhouse gases well now it's too late for that because there needs to be some adaptation to it and whatnot um <laughs> you're solving much of the problem right biodiversity needs to have a differentiated answer to every sort of species to every sort of environment habitat and so the complexity of the biodiversity issue is much higher than it is for climate change, which is which makes the whole issue of cultural differentiation much more important, I would say. Um, one of the things you can one of the ways in which you can approach that would be, for example, uh, coming back to your animals, for example, is how um, the way in which we consider animals in certain society and how these cultural differences are going to impact the way in which we protect them. And uh, Martin Nussbaum has done a bit of work on that. Um, I'm not sure whether this one take on animals in the sense that it could be, for example, you could consider animals in the sense of human wildlife conflicts. We're reintroducing animals in certain areas. We're creating conflicts with human communities. Uh, many of examples, many examples in France on, you know, reintroducing uh, wild species in, in certain areas in France have created these conflicts. And these create very specific justice questions, right? Uh, how do you distribute the impacts? How do you distribute uh, potential benefits? Who decide about where to reintroduce and whatnot? Do the animals themselves have anything to say, right? Um, do we, how do you introduce an issue of procedural justice when we're talking about a non-human justice community, right? Is it a parliament of things, a parliament of animals in the sense of Latour or something like that? Uh, but how do you organize that concretely, right? You can make a philosophical argument about that, that it would, that would be desirable in a sense. Um, the, the, the more practical issues there are a bit of a, a mystery to me. But if you will, we can discuss this later on because it's going to go in all sorts of directions and. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. Uh, first is about uh, normativity in science. Um, like without uh, saying at all that the science shouldn't be normative and that science is subjective and um, uh, kind of from yeah, like observatory. I, I'm struggling with how to approach it uh, and how to like, I think like one uh, option is to like, if we want to uh, analyze environmental justice, uh, like conflicts, movements, or uh, specific policies, uh, we can choose a framework of uh, of justice and analyze whether uh, they are compatible or not. But how to choose this framework or just of justice? And how do you like in your research or in your experience um, talk about justice and like also approach this question of like knowing what is just for others or for the world or for for anything? And then the second one links to the, what you said and uh, to the just transition. Um, and I think like with the just transition um, at the beginning, the unions did a really great job with like framing the question as a, of environment protection and uh, um, uh, social or human rights um, as a win-win and as like not conflicting. Um, and they kind of like started this movement of like, we can have jobs and we can have uh, environment protection. But also I feel like uh, it's a narrative that is uh, very um, uh, useful for the firms, as you said, because uh, then there is no conflict. Like if there is a, uh, if it's win-win, well, great for everyone. And then uh, it kind of makes invisible uh, the, uh, who will actually lose on this, you know, like who will, and I think this, like, this is what we see in the Czech Republic a lot that, or anywhere, like, 
where the just transition conflict is happening that um, uh, we are just taking just transition kind of as a technical uh, process of, yeah, we will just give some money to these people and they will like take care of it. So um, yeah, my question is about the framing of the of the just transition or environmental justice movements and where is the conflict or where, how should it be directed uh, to um, not, uh, yeah, to, to have the real just transition and not just what firms think is just. Yeah. Or, yeah. I think the two questions are related to each other in, 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 in their conflict aspect. You know? We're getting into a sort of political theory discussion about what are, you know, politics should be about conflict and, what are, and what's the role of conflict in politics, right? Um, but I think one of the, the advantages of the, a justice framework, however defined, is by making these, perhaps not conflicts, but at least a different, the plurality of perceptions of the environment, of conceptualizations of the environment, and how they relate to social issues, making them visible, and not just assuming that the transition will be just. If we transition, it will be just. It will not. I mean, there's no, I mean, there's no other <laughs> policy example in recent history that if it wasn't thought to be just, had a just outcome, it's not going to happen with the environment, especially now when we come from this, right? So, so the justice framework helps make that visible. And in that sense, um, in that sense, it, 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 it assumes it's, it's, I guess it's normative element, not in the sense of saying, this is just, and this is what we should go for, right? You can do that as well. I mean, typically the environmental ethics, that's their job, right? Identifying a robust theory, a robust environmental ethic, perhaps including what a just environment should look like, right? We're not in the environmental ethics here. We're, um, much of the literature is, and this is what I tried to hint at um, here, much of the literature is in is in that second is that in that second example is in is in here what David Schlossberg did with his work is that he went he studied the environmental justice movement in the U.S. for years trying to understand what kind of principles sort of emerged from that and John tried to link it back with existing theoretical frameworks he didn't do the opposite he didn't say okay. I have Fraser Rawls and Iris Marion Young or whatever frameworks of justice. This is what just is, and I'm going to paste it on the movement and see whether it works, right? He does the opposite. He says, okay, let's look at what the, what the political claim making within the movement is and try to attach it to existing frameworks of justice that we have. From a purely theoretical perspective, that sometimes creates problems because these frameworks are not meant to sort of function together. Uh, there is issues of, um, you can't have distribution, for example, in a case where plural solutions are not possible. We have plenty of examples of that. Remember the, um, the uh, struggle around the uh, Dakota access pipeline in the US. Uh, the struggle there wasn't just about distributing smaller pipelines across the country. The issue was about not having pipelines at all because it threatened the kinship that indigenous people had with the land. In that specific case, a distributive solution is not possible because you're going to create forms of misrecognition by doing that. So theoretically, these things don't even match. And yet the movement works with both these principles without problem. So the normative position of if there is one from the environmental justice scholarship is in large part defined by why, by what comes out of the movement, by the principle that the movement itself helps uh, 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 voices um, on environmental justice. It's the environmental justice movement that defined what is just an environmental justice in a sense, um, which we don't currently have in Europe, for example, because we don't have a sort of predefined environmental justice movement. So it's, easier to say, okay, if we're using something like climate justice that has become very important in Europe, um, the first reaction is going to be, okay, but what, give me your definition. What is climate justice, right? 
Um, and so some colleagues are trying to do that exact same work that has happened in the US and trying to understand, okay, uh, we had the Fridays for Future movement, right, a couple of years ago. They only speak about climate justice. They're not talking about climate adaptation. They're not talking about climate mitigation. Of course, that's part of it. But if they talk to the press, they're going to talk about climate justice. Even Greenpeace these days only talks about climate justice. So one of the things we have to work with is trying and push these movements to further define what that justice is. And that's the normative position in which we are. So you have, I guess you have the sort of philosopher's approach where predefining what justice is. Uh, and I'm saying that in all sympathy for all my philosophy colleagues. And you have a more sort of critical social science approach that goes to the movement and asks, okay, what comes out of here? What kind of principles are we using? Does that make sense? Uh, yes, I have a, a question regarding the different scales of uh, environmental justice and redistribution. Um, you mentioned it when we looked at the cities and then on the worldwide pyramid. And like, of course, in the city, people might be disadvantages, but if they're living in Brussels, they're probably like on a world scale. Yeah. Um. So, but my question here is like, okay, if we look for at Brussels, there's like a city government or like the Belgium government that can like do some redistribution. Oh, you and, don't want to go into Belgian politics. No, sorry, <laughs> like that Paris, whatever. But like, there's like a, an organizational... Uh, entity that could theoretically take care of this, like do something, create policy. But if we look at a global perspective and we talk uh, between redistribution between countries, there is like no, no uh, structure for that. Do you think it would be smart to like create a structure like this? How could that look like? Or should we like, is there, do we just need a different approach that is not comparable to like a small scale thing? Well, there is one. There is one, and it, it, it's meeting every year. I mean, the UNFCCC is exactly this. Right? It doesn't have any authority. Well, that's an issue of international law, right? Uh, international, some, some lawyers say international law is not law because it doesn't have any, you know, because it can't be enforced. And yet, we see it has impact. It has, it's too slow, it's uh, inefficient, it doesn't work, but, um, and I'm and I'm the first one to be frustrated about these, you know, these conference of the parties and that meet every year that spend a ton of money on, you know, flying across the world and and super frustrating. And to be honest, I'm I'm not sure how else you want to solve this except for having a very sort of um, autocratic approach to environmental friendly autocratic rule that says okay from now on uh, i decide everything um, uh, and i solve the environmental problem but if that's the cost of solving the issue is it really worth it um, so i'm afraid that we're stuck with certain democratic institutions that we have and that's a good thing as well Right. But how democratic is the institution we have at the moment? Well, that you know, the UNFCCC, you mean? Yes. Yeah, well, that's another issue, of course. So we don't have it. Like, we have a useless, non-democratic institution. Right. But, I mean, I could give you lots of examples of local institutions, especially in Brussels, that are as inefficient as some of the things that happen at the UNFCCC. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, that gets into, I mean, yeah, this becomes a sort of political theory discussion about, you know, environmental democracy and how... Uh, our sense of democracy should evolve um, under the influence of the environmental crisis, that we should work on improving the, our democratic system because um, not only is it inefficient, but it's not uh, rapid enough to provide the kind of answers we need. Uh, but yeah, that, that links to certain arguments that you sometimes uh, hear that say, um, Yes, we should get out of capitalism, but um, we can't because the issue is too pressing and therefore uh, we'll leave, leave that for later, right? Leave the revolution for later. I'm simplifying the argument, but made me think of a bit of that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm contradicting myself here, but uh, uh, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, 
definitely these institutions are inefficient, but the question is, do we want to give up on them? And if so, what alternative do we have? And um, you know, we don't have an alternative for purely technical issues. I think the purely political dimension in terms of democracy are even more complex. And and yeah, that's um that's way out of my comfort zone. <laughs> Uh, I want to come back with the about the frameworks of justice and uh, just transition. So, like, I I agree with what has been said about like the the discrepancy between like uh, theories and practice about this concept. And I think like I think it's the main problem when we talk about this um, this justice frameworks is that there is like really a big problem between like the theory of the of these frameworks and the actual practices of it. And um, I liked I liked the framework of the procedure justice of like also inviting like every stakeholders and like that have different interests interest but also like coming from different social backgrounds to like discuss on the table around a specific topic. I found that like quite nice to like have this deliberative approach about what is just. Um, and I think like, but I feel like for example there was this uh, so there was the convention uh, the climate convention in France uh, and like that's a good example of, for me at the beginning of what could have been just like invite a lot of different people to talk about like um, what would be like the environmental policies and they all discuss about it for like eight months come with propositions agree together on that and then after that um like most of them have not been taken by the government the french government and um for that like that how how we back to the previous question like yeah democratic innovation and, yeah, yeah so how how to guarantee like the like the, the question of power is still very important and how to guarantee like that this procedural justice approach are like just until the end like right. also efficiently with the policy making remember the second definition I gave from David Harvey, that it's about power inequalities and how these power inequalities have different environmental dimension. That's exactly the type of issues we're looking at, right? It's not just about putting a bunch of people around the table. Um, it's about, you know, what kind of power dimensions do we have and how these power dimensions are either going to influence what kind of uptake we have in policymaking or even at the table itself, how these power dimensions are going to influence the discussions and whatnot. Um, some people, some critical voices of the environmental justice li literature would say that that's one of the weaknesses of the literature is that that power dimension um, also in the movement is lacking. Um, that when I refer to David Pello, that he said that, you know, it was a mistake of the environmental justice movement to focus initially on the state because these power dimensions are so prevailing within the state apparatus that it's only going to be tokenistic in a way. It's okay, the EPA is going to create a nice environmental justice tool, it's going to test its environmental policy to certain uh, distributional effects. But the underlying causes of that distributional effect are not addressed with that, right? Um, and so perhaps you need not just environmental justice, but other more critical theoretical or political influences that contribute to this. And I think that sort of third generation um, literature is exactly trying to do that. How does capital influence that? How does the market capitalism itself, how does that system prevent us from reaching a stage of justice that we would want to see happen? How does the state that seemed like a sort of low hanging fruit initially, how is that preventing our actions because of its intrinsic power inequalities are present there? How do, um, um, if you're looking, if you're applying these frameworks in the global South, for example, these environmental justice frameworks that come from the US, Europe, European scholars, you apply that to the global South, how does that power dimension in the way in which we produce knowledge in the epistemology that we use to address these things, how is that influencing the way in which we uh, address environmental justice? Yeah. So I think these more critical environmental justice approaches are exactly pointing to 
to this lack of attention to, to, to the power dimension, even though it was one of the definitions that were so important. I think that's, yeah, you're putting the finger or something that is on some of the gaps of the, of the approach. Yeah, maybe maybe just yeah, a quick comment. You already tackled it uh, with what Lorena mentioned. Uh, I think it's very clear with the current um, um, yeah emissions um, debate uh, between um, developed and developing countries who like suffer most uh, from uh, the emission tackled by developed country and. For example, like an event like COP27 or COP in general, like all countries are present and everyone presenting their problems and how they're suffering um, from the consequences. But in the end, who who has the decision? Like now all like the last COP27 is all about loss and damage and trying to make developed countries uh, pay for for um, for their actions. But in the end, the decision who will take the decision, they will take the decision developed countries to either pay or not and i don't think being together in one place is just will solve the problem like yeah it's, Probably not. Uh, yeah no. I'm a bit i don't think anyone is saying that the cop in itself will solve the issue right um it's it's a whole bunch of different actions that are needed from a very local uh point to to including potentially a sort of global framework to solve and issues perhaps not in this model perhaps we've arrived at the dead end and it's not and cop 27 should i mean gives the impression of of, of having reached a sort of dead end in a sense uh, it's very disappointing even more so than than previous ones um does that mean we have to give up on sort of you know a global framework in which it's 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 pretty impressive in terms of purely democratic innovation. What we created as a global community in the '90s, um, something that you know these things didn't exist. It was invented from scratch. You know, there was um, all countries sitting together with considering all the sort of colonial history that was still very present in the '90s and in the discussion, and um, having managed in that context to set up something like that. Um, was pretty impressive. We can discuss about how efficient it is today and whether that is still needed. But we have to, I mean, we have to stress that this was pretty radical in a way in terms of democratic innovation um, and has, has created some output, right? Um, again, incomplete. And no one is saying that that in itself should be enough. Um, but yeah, we should we should definitely improve what we have, uh, but maybe not throw away the baby with the bathwater. Uh, Professor, I just have a comment about the representation of the Indian um, environmental movement. I'm a bit disappointed by uh, the narrative because um, specifically the community that participated in the Chipko movement has an extremely rich history of environmental participation, for instance, women for this community are known to provide breast milk to uh, goat calves uh, when uh, and other animals as well. Um, and these things are completely erased from the history of environmental movement that that you have shown, including like um, the his like um, the Bishnoi community specifically has been participating in environmental um, uh, uh, activism since the 1700s. Uh, it's not a recent phenomenon for sure. And also in the United States, like the the Native American community has been talking about the environment since colonization. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and books like the late Victorian Holocaust talk about how famines were constructed by colonization, which is again Absolutely. an environmental protest. And all these things are generally missing from this discussion. I don't think that they're just three generations of environmental movements or conversations and um absolutely yeah. very good point i mean that's exactly the issue that i tried to stress with there's two takes on this one is the movement that calls itself the environmental justice movement and the other is all the other movements that historically have always been fighting local movements grassroots movement that have always been fighting 
um, at this intersection between social and political issues and purely environmental issues. Um, and that is exactly that. Uh, of course, this wasn't meant to be exhaustive. This is just a couple of examples, uh, even for the US. I mean, there's, there's a variety of different movements in what I have called here the environmental justice movement. And that doesn't do justice to it at all. Um, it's just a bunch of illustrations of what uh, is meant by non-US environmental justice movements in a sense. And the literature on political ecology is full of these examples that you've mentioned on how uh, movements since the beginning of time have always been, well, not movements, communities. They weren't even movements. They were communities were always struggling around uh, that intersection. Um, and so, yes, absolutely, you're right. Absolutely. The question is, are these environmental justice movements or um, are they something else, right? Uh, do they bring something else to the table? I, I would argue that they bring other things to the table that the sort of traditional environmental justice movement didn't have because of its local specificity and its US framing and whatnot. Um, and therefore, I'm not sure I would agree with People, some people say there is a global environmental justice movement. I'm not sure I would agree with that. And that doesn't take away their relevance or what they bring to this whole discussion, but maybe we should call them something else, right? To recognize their specificity, to recognize how they, the cultural difference that they bring that we know is so important in solving some of these environmental issues to respecting that and to making that visible, rather than trying to frame it within something that clearly comes from a US framing of the issue. Because if you call it environmental justice, if you want it or not, or you like it or not, you're bringing with it the whole issue of justice. And justice itself is embedded within certain ways of thinking about certain philosophical ways of thinking about what is the right way to do? And so you're not getting to get, you're not going to get rid of that sort of thinking by calling it environmental justice. So perhaps we should come up with other names. Yeah. because potentially they're making other things invisible. I mean, there's, there's quite some discussion in environmental justice literature about how the dominance of the African-American community within the movement was completely erasing certain other struggles. Remember the principles I showed you. The first was the sacredness of Mother Earth. First principle uh, in the 90s of environmental justice completely disappeared after that. And some people like David Pello argued that it was in part because the African-American community was so important within the movement that of course it pushed its own interest within that movement and erased other ways of interacting with the environment um, by that framing. You know? Sure, but by the way you call something, sometimes you exclude certain things even without wanting to do so. That would be my 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 position thank you very much brendan thanks for coming here thanks for the speech thanks for being the last speaker before vacation thank thanks you thanks for, for being here on friday night <laughs>